So, uh, good, good morning. Can, can you all hear me from back there? Perfect. So, uh, bonjour and uh, bonjour. Uh, I'd like to start off by, by acknowledging the traditional lands we have the privilege to be walking on. Uh, so, once again, um, I'm not a housing guy. I, I'm a children's lung doctor at the uh, Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. Um, and, and I think I think I'm going to start with a little bit of a story before I get to my talk. Uh, you're probably wondering what is a lung doctor doing at a housing conference in Thunder Bay. Uh, I, maybe I've wondered about that too. Um, and the reality is that uh, my my hospital in Ottawa received a contract to provide pediatric care for children in Nunavut uh, about 15, 20 years ago. And we started seeing an unbelievable number of kids from Nunavut with, with incredibly bad lung disease. And, and nobody knew why. And there were questions whether there's some weird bug that lives in Nunavut that doesn't live anywhere else. And there were other researchers who went looking for these things and, and they didn't find them. And, and I started to say, well, um, these kids must live in, 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 in really tightly sealed houses because it's really cold outside. Maybe these houses are, are trapping various indoor air pollutants, uh, and that's what making, what's making these kids sick. And I think we need to start looking at these houses and looking at the air in these houses. Uh, so we started building a research team back then to start measuring stuff in, in houses in Nunavut. Uh, and I can tell you that it's been, I think, the most important and the most rewarding research that I'll have done in my career. Um, and we now know a lot about air quality and, and houses in Nunavut, I think mostly from our research. Um, but we've known very little about, about houses in, in, in First Nations communities. So that's been kind of the next stage of my research career, is starting to look at, look at houses in First Nations communities. Uh, and I'll be, present, be presenting uh, some of this, this research this morning. And I think it's essential that I, that I acknowledge the uh, participation of NAD, who've been incredibly supportive and helpful in getting this research off the ground. Um, and the, the next stage of my career after this is going to be uh, a study which you may have heard about yesterday called the FANCY study, which will be looking at First Nations uh, environmental uh, housing and nutritional health in, in communities ac across Canada. And, and the, I think it's, it's so important because I think houses here and in uh, Nova Scotia and in British Columbia are going to be so different. And we won't know about these things unless we measure them. And I think the final thing I'll say is kind of an, an introduction um, is you may be wondering, well, why are we doing this stuff? And, and I think the most important thing that we're going to do is provide you and governments with data. Because at the end of the day, uh, unfortunately, what, what governments, governments listen to the most are numbers. And if we can go back to government with numbers and give you numbers so that you can say that, look, 70% uh, of our houses do not meet Canadian uh, air quality standards, for example, for ventilation. That's the kind of information that governments can use. And, and that's really what this is all about. So with that as an introduction, <clears throat> I need to turn all of you a little bit into lung specialists. So, so we'll spend a moment doing this. So, um, you know, you've got, let's see if this, this laser's not really working very well. No. Oh, there, there it is, okay. Um, you know, you've got your windpipe, which is in medical terms, your trachea, which divides into your major airways, your bronchi. And these divide into very, very tiny little airways called bronchioles. And at the ends of those airways are your air sacs, which are called alveoli. And the air sacs are where gas exchange takes place, where <clears throat> you absorb oxygen into your body and you take a waste gas called carbon dioxide, transfer it from your blood into these alveoli so you can breathe it out. Oops. So the main conditions we're going to talk about, first of all, is an infection called bronchiolitis. So bronchiolitis is an infection of... <clears throat> those very tiny airways inside the lungs. In most cases of bronchiolitis are caused by a virus called RSV, or respiratory syncytial virus. And RSV makes these little bronchioles narrow. They fill up with mucus and they get swollen, and then babies have trouble breathing and they wheeze. <clears throat> and 
and it's a really serious infection, uh, especially in Indigenous kids all across Canada. It, it's also an important infection in, in Southern kids, and we'll come back to that. Another infection, which all of you have heard about, is pneumonia. And pneumonia is mostly an infection of those little air sacs in the lungs. They get fill up with bacteria and sometimes viruses and, and mucus and pus, and again, cause, cause trouble breathing. And one of the confusing things is that virus I just mentioned, the RSV, uh, can, can, it can move from the bronchioles and then attack the alveoli. So often kids with RSV don't have bronchiolitis or pneumonia, they have both. So as a lung specialist, when I talk about these things, we simply call it lower respiratory tract infections or LRTI, which covers both the bronchioles and also the, the alveoli. <clears throat> the other disease which all of you have heard about is asthma. And asthma is mainly an infection, uh, a, a, a disease that affects the bronchi. And in, in asthma, basically your airways react to things that they shouldn't react to. And the way I think of asthma is a little bit like if this room caught fire and filled up with smoke, your lungs would have a couple of reactions in your bronchi to try and keep you as healthy as you can. Uh, there are little muscles around your bronchi that would narrow to try and keep the smoke out of your lungs. The, the lining of your lungs would get swollen and you would start to cough and wheeze and produce mucus so that that soda gnash would get stuck and you can cough it out. And those are normal reactions that happen to everybody, for example, in a burning building. In people with asthma, your lungs have those reactions for dumb reasons, for things that shouldn't give them those reactions. So in, in people our age, if you have asthma, the, the commonest triggers are things you might be allergic to. So dogs or cats or tree pollens. And in little kids, most asthma attacks are also caused by viral infections, things like colds. So, so those viral infections is a really important part of the picture, which I want to be painting for you this morning. So if we go back to bronchiolitis, that RSV uh, causes little mini epidemics in children everywhere in the world. And, and actually right now, the, the RSV epidemic is happening right now in my children's hospital. So they're not terribly thrilled that I'm here or not there, but that's their problem. Um, and in a typical winter, out of every thousand babies who are born in Ottawa or Toronto or Edmonton or Montreal, out of every thousand babies, 10 of them will get admitted to hospital with RSV bronchiolitis. <coughs> this winter in Nunavut, um, out of every thousand babies born, about two to 300 will get admitted to hospital with RSV, which is basically the highest rate report anywhere in the world. And that's how I got interested in this whole area in the first place. Uh, in Alaska, rates are almost as high as in Nunavut. So again, they're about 200-ish uh, per thousand children. And we did a study in the Sioux Lookout zo Zone of the Sioux Lookout Regional Health Authority, looking at communities which are serviced by the hospital in Sioux Lookout. And what we basically found was the rates of RSV in Sioux, the Sioux Lookout Zone were 40 per thousand. So not as high as in Nunavut, but about four times higher than the rest of Canada. The other important piece is when we did this study, we looked at about uh, 100 children admitted to hospital in Sioux Lookout. Um, and they typically had the same kinds of viruses we would be expecting. But, but this graph shows you uh, in, in, um, in blue, uh, the, number, the rates of RSV uh, hospitalizations in different communities. And since I don't have permission from all these communities to give you their data, I blacked out the names of these communities. Uh, but you can see that the rates of RSV varied from like about 20 per thousand up to about 140 per thousand. So huge differences between these different communities. Um, and, and what this, this I think is really telling us is that given that um, historically these populations are relatively similar, there must be environmental differences between these communities, uh, which is affecting these hospitalization rates. And, and clearly, the most likely environmental difference between these communities is housing. So, as a, as a lung doctor, when I think about indoor air, there's a lot of things that I think about. And, and the things that can affect indoor air um, are, first of all, the house's construction. Is it wood? Is it concrete? Uh, what renovations have been done? 
What's the volume of the house? Um, then we need to look at ventilation and leakage into the house. We need to think about infiltration, which is going to happen in most houses. So outdoor uh, air components can then affect indoor air components, depending on how much infiltration is going on. So outdoor things like plants, mold spores, factories, air pollution, wind, all is going to affect infiltration. We need to think about uh, damage. So is there compromise to the air vapor barrier, uh, water damage, mold, flooding around the house? Um, and we need to think about the occupancy uh, of the house and the habits of the people in the house. So do they smoke? Do they use marijuana? Are there pets? What kind of cleaners do they use? Uh, what kind of hobbies? What kind of furnishings and paints do they use? Um, and all of these things are, are, are going to impact air quality. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that air quality changes all the time in anybody's house. And it's also going to vary between different rooms as you've got air flows going between different rooms. So, so this stuff is incredibly complicated. Um, in the United States, the Center for Disease Control has criteria for certain air pollutants. Um, and some of those pollutants also happen inside houses. Probably the one which is the most important uh, in outdoor air, according to the CDC, which I also care about as an indoor air guy, is a thing called PM 2.5s. So PM 2.5 are very tiny particles, less than 2.5 microns in diameter. And basically, according to the CDC, uh, you want your PM 2.5 to be on average less than about 35 micrograms per cubic meter, uh, or over a one year period, less than about 15 micrograms per cubic meter. And, and those, those are really numbers which get used both for indoor and outdoor air as a monitor of air quality all over the world. Uh, in terms of what kinds of things I think are relevant to this area, to, to, to north of here, the Sulukout zone, um, probably three things which people carry about a lot. The first one are wood stoves. And wood stoves have been associated with coughing and wheezing in young children, uh, both in Michigan and with bronchiolitis and uh, pneumonia in Navajo children in the southern United States. Uh, obviously, there's lots of concern about mold. And we know that in other communities, uh, you can get allergic to mold, which increases your risk of asthma. And a thing called endotoxin. So there are two kind of main kinds of bacteria in the world. There are what we call gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative bacteria. And gram-negative bacteria are things like E. coli, which I'm sure you've heard about when you hear about water. And part of the, the walls of these bacteria contains a thing called endotoxin. And endotoxin, if you inhale it, is incredibly inflammatory. It, it makes your lungs really unhappy. So exposure to endotoxin is associated with acute respiratory infections in the first year of life. And it has kind of a weird effect uh, on asthma. Um, if, if you're a little kid and you're exposed to endotoxin, your immune system gets really busy as a very young child dealing with the endotoxin. And it's so busy, it doesn't have time to develop allergies. So people who live in places where there's lots of endotoxin, uh, people who live, for example, on farms or perhaps in, in, in places like Bangladesh, uh, those kids are exposed to a lot of endotoxin early in life. They have a very low rate of asthma. Uh, if you're a little kid growing up in Toronto in, an, in, a, in a very clean house and your mom uses Purell everywhere and your dad doesn't want you to go to the playground because there's germs there, you're exposed to very little endotoxin and your immune system gets bored and starts developing allergies. So exposure to endotoxin early in life decreases your risk of asthma. However, uh, if you get asthma anyways and then you're exposed to endotoxin, endotoxin later on in life then makes your asthma worse. So it's kind of got this two-handed approach to what happens when you're exposed to endotoxin. Uh, so in terms of PM 2.5s, we know that PM 2.5 increases the risk of wheezing in children, the risk of lower respiratory tract infections, and increased rates of, uh, of asthma. And PM 2.5 uh, is a problem here it's especially a problem in places like, like uh, India or Africa, where people use, um, burn a lot, a lot of uh, biomass for their heating and their cooking, and you get really inc incredibly high levels of PM 2.5 that increases risk of lung disease in kids, 
uh, especially it causes problems like chronic bronchitis in adults. And in places like India and Africa, chronic bronchitis from PM2.5 is especially a problem in women because women do more of the cooking than men. And also in their daughters, because daughters tend to hang around their moms when they're doing the cooking. So one thing which can make all of these things better is ventilation. And, and ventilation is the introduction of outdoor air into the house, which is going to dilute any contaminants inside the house and also displace them. So it decreases the, the concentration of all indoor air contaminants not necessarily to a safe level, but it's gonna make all of these things better. One thing to keep in mind in a place like Toronto is ventilation can also worsen your indoor air quality if there's a lot of outdoor air pollution and it's bringing those pollutants inside. Uh, you can achieve ventilation naturally, either by uh, opening windows and doors or by infiltration, or you can use mechanical ventilation. And that can either be an exhaust only system like kitchen and bathroom fans, which push air out so that more air is going to leak in, or using a balance system uh, like ducted fans or heat recovery or moisture uh, energy recovery ventilators. So I'm an air guy, but I think it's really important that we also think about water. And you think, well, what does water have to do with lower respiratory tract infections? Lungs, water, what's the connection? Uh, and probably the best data on water and lower respiratory infections comes from uh, Western Alaska. And uh, there's a study which looked at about 60,000 Alaska Native persons living along the coast. And these communities are a little synonymous to, to Northern Canada. These are all uh, communities that do not have road access. They're, they're all uh, air access only or water in the summer. Um, and am amazingly, these communities have even more dismal problems with water than we see in some parts of Canada. So there's lots of communities here where very few of the houses are serviced with potable water. And so many people are bringing water uh, to their houses in, in five liter jugs. And basically the houses that don't have water service have kids with a higher rate of lower respiratory infections. And that makes sense because if all the potable water you have, you have to carry in uh, one by one, uh, you're not going to wash your hands as often. You may not wash everything else as often. And since most respiratory infections are commonly spread, what we call the hand to nose route. So in other words, um, your, your daughter has a cold. She sneezes in a doorknob. Uh, her brother touches the doorknob, scratches his nose. He's going to get that infection. And so washing your hands is how you prevent that. So I'm going to move from there and start talking about indoor air quality. And since my research was initially in Nunavut, I want to start by talking about Nunavut. And, and by the way, uh, the picture over here uh, of those kids, uh, I, I took next to the Arctic Ocean uh, in a community called Iglulik. And it was minus 60 when I took that picture. Um, and I, I couldn't believe how cold minus 60 feels. Um, and these kids are hanging out, they're, they're, they're like, they, they've got their faces exposed. And, uh, I, I took my hand out of my glove for like 15 seconds to take this picture, and my hand turned into like this frozen claw. It was, it was unbelievable. So uh, my research in Nunavut took place mainly in four communities. So um, Cape Dorset, which is down in the south part of Baffin Island, uh, Iglulik, which is between the mainland and uh, Nunavut, Baffin Island, Pond Inlet at the very, very top of the island, Clyde River, and, uh, and Pangnertun. Uh, and the first study we did was in Cape Dorset. And basically what we did in Cape Dorset is I wanted to know what could possibly be in these houses that may be helping contribute to making these kids sick. So we measured everything we could think of in the houses of 20 babies in Cape Dorset. And um, these houses were small, they were single story, they're raised above ground because of permafrost. The average uh, volume was about 200 cubic meters versus about four to 600 per house in, in Ottawa or Toronto. And these houses were crowded. They had an average of six people per house, uh, up to 12 people in some of these houses. And, and the Inuit like keeping their houses hot. 
So uh, the average temperature was almost 24 degrees. Uh, and as a result, these houses were really dry. The uh, average relative humidity was about 25%. So this gives you a sense of the average occupancy in these houses. You can see the average number was six people per house with this range up to about 12 people. So these are some of the communities. Um, I've already shown you this picture from McGlulick. Um, Pond Inlet is also a great story. Pond, oh, Pond Inlet's on the very top of Baffin Island. And um, the housing manager had got a, a uh, message from Ottawa to make the houses in Pond Inlet more colorful so it would be a better tourist attraction. And he thought this was the stupidest thing he'd ever heard. So he found the most outlandish colors he could possibly find to make Pond Inlet look like Jelly Bean Row in, in St. John's, Newfoundland. So there's yellows and there's pinks and there's blues and uh, it's, uh, it's pretty unique. So we looked at uh, houses in four communities after Cape Dorset all across Baffin Island. And the main thing that we found was ventilation was less than recommended by Canadian standards in 80% of the houses that these uh, Inuit children were living in. Um, it's recommended that a house have about 7.5 liters per second per person of ventilation. The average in these houses was 5.6. Um, most of these houses really had minimal exhaust equipment. Uh, if they had anything, they had kitchen and bathroom fans. A lot of people didn't use them because they were broken or they were noisy. And I think that's the theme you will see in Indigenous housing uh, from coast to coast to coast in Canada. Another good way of looking at ventilation is by looking at carbon dioxide or CO2. And basically, um, the amount of carbon dioxide that's present in this room right now is a reflection of how many people are in this room breathing. Because natural air has very low levels of CO2. Every time you breathe, you breathe oxygen in and you breathe ox carbon dioxide out. So the carbon dioxide level in this, in this room is a reflection of how many people are breathing and how good the ventilation system in the, is in this room to get rid of that CO2. And basically, Canadian standards, uh, it's recommended that a room, whether it's a hotel or a house or a school, have less than a thousand parts per million of CO2. The average CO2 in four communities in Nunavut was almost 1,400 parts per million. And again, very similar to the last slide, uh, two thirds of these houses did not meet Canadian standards for ventilation. So the question is, does this stuff matter? And the answer is it does matter. So we did studies in Nunavut showing that kids who were living in more overcrowded houses or houses with less ventilation had higher rates of pneumonia. And this is where I think the infectious disease specialists were wrong. Because if you ask an disease, infectious disease specialist in Toronto, how do kids catch RSV? They'll say it's mostly hand to nose, like I mentioned before or droplet. So if you're within two meters of someone else with RSV and they sneeze on you, you may catch RSV. I think what's happening in these communities in Nunavut is these houses are so tightly sealed that if you sneeze in a house in Nunavut, the virus forms this aerosol cloud that sits around, the babies breathe it in, and they catch pneumonia. So this ventilation piece becomes a really important piece for things like viral infections, as well as bacterial infections and also tuberculosis. And there's some really interesting data with influenza uh, that if you catch influenza, th the traditional southern hand to nose route, you're gonna get the flu. If you get influenza by breathing that virus into your lungs, you get viral pneumonia. So this we've talked about. Uh, so the next step is we've started to think, well, what can we do to make this better? So we did another study in Nunavut, which was a randomized heat con uh, placebo-controlled trial of installing heat recovery ventilators in the houses of young Inuit children. So what we did is we took uh, HRVs, we installed them in about 50 houses, and either they, we had them function as HRVs, um, so that they would bring fresh air from outside, uh, bring it into the house, mix it in a core with warm, stale air from outside, transfer the heat to the fresh air, shoot that fresh air into the house, take the now cooler 
uh, air from inside the stale air, shoot it out of the house so that you improve ventilation while maintaining energy efficiency. So in half of the houses, they function as HRVs. In the other half of the houses, they function as placebos. So basically they took stale air from inside the house, put it into the core and shot it back into the house. So that it looked like an HRV, it sounded like an HRV, but it wasn't actually changing ventilation in the house. And at the end of the study, we, we uh, reversed the mechanism and everyone who had an HRV had an actual functioning HRV. So in this study, we found that we look, when we looked at wheezing, which is mainly caused by viral infections in, 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 in little kids, uh, in the kids who had uh, active HRVs, the rate of wheezing went steadily down as the winter progressed. And in the houses which had placebo HRVs, the rate of wheezing steadily went up as the winter progressed. So we showed that these HRVs successfully prevented these kids from getting sick. Now, there are limits to HRVs, and HRVs work really well in Ottawa. Um, up here, or, or Nunavut, uh, there are problems. The, the cores can freeze when it's really cold outside. Uh, and another problem is an HRV uh, can warm outside air by about 30 degrees. So if it's minus 10 outside, uh, your air is going to come into your house at 20 degrees, and, and it's great. If it's minus 40 outside, like it is today in Thunder Bay, uh, it's, the air is going to come into your house at minus 10, and you're going to get a draft. And one of the things which I learned um, in, uh, in Nunavut, which should have been painfully obvious if I had thought about it, is elders hate drafts. And, um, and it, was a, it was a real issue in Nunavut because if the house had an elder in it um, and it was minus 40 outside, they'd either turn the HRV off. Um, there were, they would stuff socks in my HRVs. Uh, I got a phone call that one of my HRVs had been taken by an elder and left in the village dump. Um, and there's now a uh, yellow frozen liquid on my HRV. And did I want it back? Um, so... There's now sort of this research component looking at how to get HRVs that work better in, in, in these sorts of conditions. So with that, we're going to move a little bit further south and start talking about First Nations housing. So with that, I'm going to let Mike come up and um, talk a little bit more about First Nations housing. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kavessi. Um, so my name is uh, Michael McKay. I'm, uh, as uh, an introduction by uh, Roger said, uh, I'm the uh, Infrastructure and Housing Director at the uh, Nishinaabiaski Nation. Um, so uh, quickly, about, quick overview about NAN. Uh, we're a PTO, uh, Political Territorial Organization. Uh, we represent uh, 49 First Nations. Uh, mainly in uh, uh, in northern Ontario, um, uh, the the territory covers about two thirds uh, of Ontario, from the Manitoba border to uh, the Quebec border. Uh, we have about um, uh, thirty two remote First Nations as well within there. Um, also, uh, uh, a little bit of a background: I am from uh, Bearskin Lake, Ontario. It's a remote community north of here. Um, uh, by schooling, I'm uh, an architectural technologist and I've been lucky enough to work with our communities for since, you know, as a summer student in 2000 at uh, Windigo uh, First Nations Council and to IFNA Tribal Council. And I was lucky enough to work at uh, Ontario First Nations Technical Service Corporation. Uh, so I, I was able to see the work with northern communities and also uh, within the Ontario region as well. So I've been able to, uh, been lucky enough to work with all the communities. Um, yeah, so just to go back on this, I was hoping that I would have another picture there. Um, you know, in the case of, uh, in the case of housing, uh, what we're trying to build within, within our communities, um, I know it's, Housing is more complex and complicated. You know, we're, 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 we're trying to build to um, certain codes and standards. 
Um, and, but there's challenges too, right? As Dr. Kabesi said, I uh, can't yeah. imagine how, how you build homes in areas like uh, Nunavut, uh, so far north and remote. And some of our communities, like I said, we have 33, they face some of those challenges, um, you know, with, uh, with the remoteness factor, with, uh, with the winter roads, you know, we have winter roads that are open right now. Uh, some of them are, are not open to uh, truck hauling, just uh, light, uh, light traffic, meaning trucks. And so there's always uh, challenges for communities on the, on the planning side of it. You know, there's always a, a window there of six weeks for sure, four weeks, six, six weeks to try to get materials and supplies up. And so, um, and uh, other challenges also is having those um, certified individuals to make sure furnaces are install, installed properly, HRVs are installed properly. Um, you know, it's um, with housing too, it's, um, it's a whole, there's a whole building science around it now. It's not as, it's not as simple as the older homes where, where I used to have a picture of it, but, um, you know, you have older homes where uh, they're not as airtight and not as much insulation. Um, and so, you know, you, you get a draft through the homes. So essentially you have health, healthy, a healthy space, you have fresh air. So, and now with the type of housing that's building now, you know, the, the, the homes are airtight, you know, and, and we always talked about it is uh, essentially we live in a plastic bag without without no mechanical system without taking that uh stale air out bringing the fresh air in um you know in conditions and climates where you're enclosed for six to eight months right and with other with other factors like overcrowding and uh, uh, no mechanical systems and so it does those play a factor on um um the impact i think on on people living in there, uh, impact on their health, as uh, as uh, this study is uh, talking about. And so, yeah, so you have you have um, many systems within a home. You have your your foundation system. You have your your wood burning system. Um, you have a um, uh, your HVAC system, whether it's a furnace or an HRV, and um, those now all need to work together to for for a house to to properly work you know when i talked about the building sciences of a home you know if it's if it's too enclosed if it's sealed tight which is supposed to right and so uh you know and there's a positive and negative pressure within the home all of that and so uh yeah so the home the housing that's being currently built there's uh it needs to all work together with all those systems in there and um but that could also and if and if it's not working together it, it can lead to issues of mold um which impacts the health of people uh, impacts the health of children and um it also accelerates the de deterioration of the ho houses you know and so, um, so I think that that is why um, we support this this work that uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Tom Kavessi is leading, and the other groups, SLIFNA, and the other uh, uh, other organizations in there. And so, um, <clears throat> yeah. So I'll just go through some of these. Um, I talked a little bit some of the uh, the uh, the determinants of poor housing in 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 First Nation communities, uh, in Indigenous communities, when we're talking about the, in uh, areas like Nunavut, um, poorly constructed housing, uh, overcrowding of housing, uh, underfunding of housing uh, programs, uh, regular maintenance, uh, which ages the uh, housing stock. And so, and also the, the, the current housing programs that, uh, um, some of the criteria if you're trying to uh, access funding for, for housing, whether it's from uh, CMHC or Indigenous Services Canada, that uh, you have to meet those codes. You have to meet those standards, right? And so uh, it's, uh, 
And if there's not enough uh, uh, funding and planning involved, it, it can lead to those, the, 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 the conditions of uh, those homes. Uh, higher transportation of uh, costs, you know, like I said, with uh, remote communities, uh, uh, winter roads, um, infrastructure, um, and um, I, I'm just going to, to the infrastructure piece here because uh, um, the bottom right hand uh, picture there, this is uh, actually back in the bearskin. Uh, I, uh, I got permission to use it from a, a, a person I know there. And um, so that's a hold, water holding tank. You know, it's, it's, uh, it weighs a lot when it's filled up uh, with water. It's, and they use holding tanks because the lack of servicing within the communities. You know, and there's a lot, many of our communities, only 10 to 20% of the homes are connected to the water and sewer. And so you have truck haul services, right? And so you have those filled up uh, in the winter, you know, uh, water unfortunately gets into the wall cavity and causes uh, freezing and thawing. And, and um, but sometimes, those 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 holding tanks they sweat, uh, they they leak, and uh, that's what you get. You get the water uh, um, uh, pooling up within those areas, causing mold and also deterioration of the home. And you see there that holding tank fell through the floor. All right. So that's what I'm talking about the the uh, the insufficient uh, infrastructure in place that's uh, in our home and our in our communities because. Community, a lot of communities have outgrown that current uh, infrastructure that's in place right now. Um, but I uh, just, I'll close my talk off here soon. Um, you know, for, for us that, uh, for, uh, for, to be involved in a study, we've been uh, lucky to be involved uh, we want to make sure that uh, that uh, we support the work that's happening, uh, and so uh, you know, at NAN we are an advoca uh, advocacy group. And we want to be able to, um, you know, when we when this study is complete, that uh, uh, communities and First Nations are able to use this study and use that data uh, to to ensure that uh, um, you know we're building healthy homes. Uh, healthy environments for 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 their community members, um, but also uh, for us to is uh, you know to talk about uh, ensuring that uh, ensuring communities have that access to to healthy housing and and also try and uh, uh, if there's possibilities for to influence uh, change influence uh, policy and. Uh, uh, advocate. Uh, that's uh, that's kind of part of our work, and this is why we'll uh, keep supporting this uh, keep supporting this study. So, uh, thank you for that. So, I, I think this is such an important slide, and you know, all the different pieces in this uh, infrastructure, um, capacity building, governance to make sure housing managers ha have the resources to do their jobs. Uh, I'll play a terribly important role in, in the stuff which I'll be talking about next. <clears throat> so one of the questions which often comes up is with the wood stoves, would having cleaner uh, burning wood stoves make a difference? And, and uh, it, it's complicated. Probably the best studies on wood stoves comes from a place called Libby, Montana. And I've never been to Libby, but my understanding is Libby is kind of at the bottom of a soup bowl, it's surrounded by mountains. Uh, there's a lot of temperature inversions, and Libya is almost entirely heated by wood stoves. So they've done some studies where they've taken old wood stoves and replaced them with new, clean-burning, EPA-certified wood stoves. Um, and it did make a difference. Interestingly, it had made more of a difference on the outdoor air. And in Libya, if you make the outdoor air cleaner and you've got infiltration of air, it then makes the indoor air cleaner. And it did lead to the kids getting, getting fewer infections, uh, less asthma. Um, <clears throat> other studies from BC where there was the better mixing of air outside showed a little bit less of a difference. And even with wood stove technology, that education piece is really important. So they did a sil similar study at the uh, 
Mays Paris uh, Reservation in Idaho, where they installed wood stoves, but they didn't provide education on how to use them optimally, and they didn't see a lot of a difference. So the study which I'll talk, be talking about next is a study which we just finished in the Sulica uh, Health Authority Zone. Um, <coughs> and the, I'll, 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 I'm going to preface this by saying that this meeting is happening about a month earlier than I wish it did. Uh, because we've just finished getting our data. We, I've hired the best statistician I know to analyze it. But hiring the best statistician means that you've also hired the busiest statistician. Um, and getting our data analyzed isn't fully finished yet. So this is very preliminary data, and there's going to be more to come. So, so basically, what I wanted to do based on our earlier research is take four communities, two which had high rates of bronchiolitis, and two communities with relatively low rates of bronchiolitis, um, and start looking at housings in those communities. And this research has been supported by NAN, uh, by, by SLIFNA, uh, Health Canada, uh, my hospital, and Carleton University. So the communities we looked at, if you're not from uh, Ontario, um, are Lac so let Sioux Lookout is here. And so obviously we're here at Thunder Bay. Sioux Lookout is here. From Sioux Lookout, we looked at uh, Lac Sioux, which is very close by, uh, a ro road accessible community. Uh, Sandy Lake First Nation, uh, Kitchener Make us a First Nation, or Big Trout Lake and Casabonica Lake. So what we did in the study is um, we gave a respiratory uh, health questionnaire. Um, we uh, had a housing inspection done by Gail Lawler, who's uh, sitting in the audience, who is absolutely essential for this study. Uh, we looked at the wood stoves by measuring PM 2.5s. We looked at indoor mold by looking at a uh, part of the mold uh, wall which is uh, called uh, beta-glucan. And we measured the beta-glucan in the dust. Uh, we also looked at endotoxin and levoglucosan, which are good co uh, components of wood when you burn wood in wood stoves. We measured ventilation, looking at indoor CO2. And then we looked at uh, visits to the health center, either for respiratory illnesses uh, or for skin problems. We found looking at skin is also an important co uh, concern in these communities. So you want to see if there's any relationship between housing and, and skin issues. Uh, and we also looked at medevacs. And uh, we measured mold uh, using a recommended CMHC uh, guideline, which says a small amount of mold is seeing a surface area mold that's less than a square meter. Uh, a medium amount is less than three square meters. And a large amount is more than three square meters. So what did we find? So we looked at 102 children uh, half of them were males. The average age was 1.4 years. So these are really little kids. Um, in the first year of life, they had about 0.7 lower respiratory infections per child per year, which is a lot. Uh, ha about half of them had at least one lower respiratory infection. Uh, they had roughly two visits to the nursing station per year for colds. Uh, and they had about 0.4 medevacs per child per year. Again, most in the first year of life. And a quarter of these kids have been medevaced at least once. 20% um, of them had been hospitalized for chest illness in the first two years of life. Uh, and as we kind of would have expected with that, that stuff I talked about with the endotoxin, relatively few kids in this study had asthma. Only 4% of them had asthma. Whereas in Ottawa, about 10% of Ottawa kids would have asthma. In terms of the houses, um, the data was actually in some ways, amazingly similar to, to Nunavut, I guess. Similar kind of houses get built in Indigenous communities in Canada, to some extent. The average occupancy was 6.6 .6 persons per house, which is almost exactly the same as we saw in Nunavut. Um, the average house volume was about 240 cubic meters. Um, about three quarters of the male guardians smoked, and about three quarters of the, the female guardians smoked. Um, the average winter temperature inside these houses was nearly 26 degrees. So again, these houses are hot. Uh, they're fairly dry. The average humidity was about 35%. Um, and there's not a lot of dust mites. Dust mites are the little animals that live in dust that cause allergies in southern homes. Less of it here than there would be at, down south. And dust mites like humidity. So if it's dry, they're, they're, not, they're not happy. 
Uh, so once again, this gives you a sense of the occupancy rates. So the average occupancy was just around six, but there were houses that had 18 people living in one house. Uh, in terms of the houses, uh, about 70% had potable water, safe to drink, 30% didn't. Um, uh, nearly half of the houses uh, had a tendency to flood outside. And again, this comes back to governance, to planning, to the things that Michael was talking about. Because if you have a house, again, living in a hollow, uh, and it's a wooden house with flooding outside, that house is going to rot. Um, at least 23% of the houses had grading sloping towards the house. 43% um, had water penetration in the exterior walls. 44% uh, through the windows. Uh, and only half of the houses had undamaged windows. The other half had either cracked pit planes, moisture damaged sills. Uh, in terms of heating, uh, about half of the houses were wood stove only. Another quarter were, were wood stove and electric. So three quarters of these houses were being heated at least partly by wood stoves. And uh, only 17% were heated only by electricity. Um, we saw visible mold in 12% uh, of the children's uh, bedrooms windows and about 10% of the bathroom in the rest of the house. Um, and I think part of what's, what's happening in, 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 in the houses is if you imagine the house is kind of rectangular and the wood stove is at one end of the house uh, and the kids' bedrooms are at the other end of the house, um, anyone who's lived in these houses will tell you that the kids' bedrooms, first of all, are cold. So you're going to get more condensation in the windows. Uh, a second important factor is as, especially with older wood stoves where you have to replace the wood fairly frequently, you have large temperature fluctuations within that house. And as some of the elders have told me, again, you get more temperature fluctuations, you're gonna get more condensation, more mold build, building up. Um, and in some of these houses, people tend to spend most of the times in the living room. So, and, and the bedrooms often is kind of where you, you, you dump stuff. So if you're dumping a lot of stuff, again, next to the walls, next to the windows, that area is going to get more damp. And again, that becomes a risk factor for mold. Um, the, uh, the bathrooms are, 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 are really concerning. Um, about half of the bathrooms were uh, working, but in poor condition. Again, coming back to what Michael was talking about, uh, lots of opportunity for condensation, for mold buildup, uh, for deterioration of the, the structure of the bathroom. Um, and again, especially if the bathroom has fans which are either broken or not being used because they're noisy, again, there's not a whole lot of mechanism to get moisture out of those rooms. Um, in terms of heat recovery ventilators, uh, about half the houses um, had a heat recovery ventilator, 44%. Uh, 54% didn't have any form of controlled ventilation. Um, and and, and uh, Gail pointed out that most of these HRVs were installed in the crawl space, which makes them difficult to service, uh, difficult to clean, um, and also out of sight, out of mind. So a, a lot of people uh, didn't even know that they have HRVs. And that's not unique to the Sioux Lookout Zone. I'll, I'll bet there are lots and lots of people in Ottawa who don't know they have HRVs, um, but even more if, you, if your HRV is sitting in the crawl space. Uh, more importantly, when you looked at the HRVs that were there, uh, only a quarter of them, less than a quarter of them, were in good condition. 43% um, were in very poor condition. Uh, and uh, over half of the HRVs were never used. Uh, only a quarter of the HRVs were being used. So when you put this together, only half the houses had HRVs. Uh, of those, only 20% were working properly. Uh, and only half of them were being used. So somewhere between about 5 or 10% of these houses have good, working, functioning HRVs that are being used. And as Michael points out, if these houses are basically uh, Ziploc bags, so the only form of ventilation really is going to be that HRV, and you have a functioning HRV in only 5% of the houses, um, I think this becomes really important information. And I think as housing people dealing with this, um, making sure that the, uh, the housing managers are, are getting these HRVs uh, serviced regularly, 
to talking to uh, to people about how to, to clean the filters themselves becomes terribly important. These HRVs are not going to do anything unless they're going to be functional. And uh, we were having dinner last night and chatting that there, there may even be a role for having little ha uh, meetings within the communities to, to show people what the HRV is and show them how to use it. And, and I think one of the important pieces as well um, is I know when we bought our house, we, our house was built in the late 60s, we had an HRV installed. And when the HRV was installed, uh, the guy who installed it came and met me and taught me how to clean the thing. And if you move into a house where the HRV is already there, you don't kind of get an instruction manual like you do for whatever. Um, someone needs to teach you how to use it. And I think that education piece is a really important part that's missing. Uh, and this study emphasizes that. Uh, when we looked at indoor CO2 as a measure of ventilation, uh, not surprisingly, given the state of the HRVs, uh, once again, over half the houses did not meet Canadian standards for ventilation. And the average CO2 in these houses was about 1,200 parts per million, so not that different from Nunavut. Uh, we had one house where the average indoor CO2 was 1,800 parts per million. Uh, in terms of PM 2.5s, uh, once again, what you're really aiming for is a PM 2.5 that's less than about 15 um, uh, micrograms per cubic meter. Um, and when you kind of look at this in, in perspective, um, the average in Sioux Lookout was 17, so slightly above WHO recommended standards. Uh, in Ottawa, in comparison, the average would be about seven, so less than half that. Uh, and if you decide to go walking on a busy street uh, in Paris or London, PM 2.5 is slightly lower than it is in a house in the Sioux Lookout zone. So um, living in one of these houses in terms of, of, of small particles is not that dissimilar from walking next to Champs-Élysées in, in Paris. In terms of mold and endotoxin, uh, once again, those beta-glucans, the average uh, was about 270 micrograms per cubic meter. So that's about six times higher than the average for American homes. So we're certainly seeing lots of mold in these houses. Um, in terms of the average surface area of mold, it was about 0.19 uh, square meters. Um, and, and that's close to the range where kids are at a higher risk for having multiple episodes of wheezing. Um, and when we looked at endotoxin, uh, and again, I think it, part of the endotoxin reflects storing um, firewood indoors. Uh, the average endotoxin is about five, half a million units per square meter, uh, which is the highest level we've seen in any study anywhere in North America. Um, so again, there's, there's clearly issues with these houses uh, that this study is, you know, will bring to light. Uh, another thing we look at is VOCs or volatile organic compounds. These are typically things released either by wood smoke, uh, to commercial tobacco smoke, or by, by new um, furniture or new flooring, which I don't think happens too often in many of these houses. Um, and, and levels were uh, slightly elevated for formaldehyde um, and, and not necessarily for a lot of the other uh, VOCs that we looked at. So what does all this mean? So um, this is where things get a little bit more complicated because in Nunavut, you had houses with lots of problems with the indoor air quality and kids with very, very high rates of respiratory infections. So even though it's, these aren't really huge studies, it wasn't too difficult to, to find these relationships. In Sulukat, it's different because these houses also have lots of problems with the air quality um, but the kids don't get sick as often as they do in Nunavut, which makes it harder to find these relationships. And with our sort of initial statistical analyses, uh, looking at, at ventilation, PM 2.5, uh, mold and endotoxin, uh, we didn't find significant relationships um, with medevacs or with lower respiratory tract infections. Um, on the other hand, um, Next slide here. When we looked at upper respiratory tract infections, we found statistically important and significant relationships between endotoxin, 
uh, and surface areas of mold and visits to the nursing station for upper respiratory infections. Now, if you're living in Ottawa um, and you say, well, okay, you're, you have these things in your house and you're more likely to have a cold bad enough to go see a healthcare professional, so what? But it's not a so what. And the reality is um, that, move on to the next one. Um, catching colds in, in these small isolated communities is actually a big deal because upper respiratory infections are the first thing that happens before you get a lower respiratory tract infection. So if these kids are getting more upper respiratory infections, it does put them at higher risk for severe lower respiratory tract infections, uh, and, which can ultimately lead med to medevacs. And it also means that since most asthma attacks are triggered in kids by upper respiratory infections, these kids are gonna be, as they go through life, at higher risk of getting asthma and asthma attacks. So these things do matter. And a lot of the relationships that we need to be looking at, uh, other air quality factors and respiratory problems, uh, all of these different housing factors and skin problems are things that we're currently working on the analyses. So once again, th this, this story is still an evolution. So if you put all this together, uh, what conclusions can I give you so far? And I wanna leave lots of time for questions and comments as well. Um, so first of all, uh, these, these kids do have high rates of respiratory infections, uh, much higher than in Toronto, but lower than in the Inuit. Um, ventilation in the majority of these houses do, does not meet Canadian standards. Uh, these houses are very small, you all know that, and overcrowding is the norm. Um, these houses tend to be hot uh, and, and dry. Um, the majority of these houses don't have an HRV, uh, when present, most of them are located in the crawl space. They're in very poor condition um, and, and fewer used regularly. And, and part of what I mean by that poor condition um, is these houses all have dirt roads. Uh, and as all of you know who have been in these communities, they're dusty. And um, the, the, the dust clogs the filters in the HRVs. That's probably the, the single biggest problem with them. Um, and in Ottawa, uh, I, I, I get inspired by people like Gail and Michael, and I, I clean my HRV filter religiously twice a year. Um, but in these communities, these filters don't get clean, and they're not going to work. Um, that knowledge translation piece, in terms of how to use the HRVs, how to use them effectively, and, and how to make better HRVs that work better in these sort of subarctic and arctic conditions, uh, is terribly important. Um, and we need to start putting HRVs on, on main floors, not in, 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 in uh, crawl spaces where they're going to get serviced, uh, and probably come up with, again, better HRVs in these kinds of houses. Um, these houses are, are, are commonly in disrepair. Issues like broken windows, poor grading, uh, water penetration become terribly important. And, and, I, and I think, again, one of the key messages from this um, is, is I remember when we were starting the study, I was with, uh, with Michael in Casabonica, and uh, he was taking me to some houses with the housing manager. And uh, we visited a house that was a newish looking house in my eyes. It was built in 1986. And, and, the, and, and the gentleman living in that house was explaining to me that his house is, uh, is scheduled for demolition and, and replacement with a new house because it's no longer in satisfactory condition. And I went, oh my gosh, um, my house in, in Ottawa is built in the late 60s. Uh, it has some issues right now. It needs some major renovations in the basement. Um, but that house, I don't know how long houses built in Ottawa in the 60s last, but looking at it, my guess is it's going to be fine for another 30, 40 years at least. Um, and if the houses here need to be demolished after 30 years, um, it means that if you did nothing but maintain the houses so that they lasted longer, if they could last three times as long, these communities would have three times as many houses. And, and um, again, this becomes important from a government point of view because the feds love telling us about how they build X more houses each year. It looks really good in the newspapers. Um, I think to have the government say, well, we maintained 1,600 houses this year 
Uh, it's not gonna get a lot of headlines, uh, but it's terribly important. Uh, and getting that message across to government, I think is really important. And this is the kind of data which hopefully governments are going to listen to. Um, the amount of mold in these houses is significantly more than typical for, for North America. Um, and uh, a, again, the amount of uh, small particles, PM 2.5, are, are levels that are significantly higher than other Canadian houses. Uh, endotoxin levels are very, very high, which again reflects education, where to store um, uh, the firewood, uh, sort of maintaining, preventing uh, clothing from kind of accumulating in corners of the house. Um, and, and some of the volatile organic compounds, again, may be approaching levels that may have some health effects. Um, we've already talked about that asthma is less common, at least in these kids, uh, and probably a little bit less common in adults, so that data is not that clear yet. Um, we know that these factors do increase the risk of upper respiratory infections, endotoxin, mold will do that. Um, and, and, and to really look at these effects more, more, more effectively, we're going to need bigger studies. And that kind of leads us to the FANCY study, which will be giving the kinds of numbers to look at, look at this kind of data in, in hugely um, more accuracy. Um, so once again, endotoxins have these inflammatory effects. Uh, molds are known risk factors for respiratory infections. So this stuff does matter. Um, so again, I think there's lots of lessons which we, we, we can already take from this study. And that, that need for reg regular education uh, from the housing department, how to avoid mold growth, how to clean up minor areas of mold, when to talk to housing uh, about cleaning up larger areas of mold, uh, getting more funding for housing departments so they can do the major renovations that are required, um, helping with, with that HRV maintenance, uh, and then, then the other pieces, making sure that houses are independently inspected before a contractor gets paid, uh, make, having proof that the HRV is in the right place, uh, installed in the right spot, fully functioning, and, and correctly ba uh, balanced with a magnahelic gauge, uh, all important pieces to, to, to make these houses not only air, uh, energy efficient, but also healthier. Uh, we need better systems for filling the water tanks to avoid spillage to get the kinds of problems that Michael talked about. Uh, we need those maintenance funds to keep these houses in, in a state of good repair, uh, dealing with plumbing malfunctions and roof leaks immediately before they lead to major problems. Um, and, and again, I think that maintenance piece, we can't emphasize enough as being a huge part of how to make these houses healthier. So uh, I think the bottom line is, as me as a doctor uh, talking to all of you housing people, um, having you all walk away with that sense that, that houses are more than, 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 than just maintaining energy efficiency, they need to be healthy. And when you're building houses, thinking about that linkage, I think becomes uh, terribly important. And even though I'm a lung doctor, um, houses affect so many more things than just respiratory health and maybe skin health, uh, in terms of mental health, uh, in, in terms of having a place to, to, to leave if the house you're in isn't safe. Um, so it's not just maintaining houses, but it's also building more houses that are all terribly important uh, to improving the health of all of these communities. Um, I think that capacity building uh, for housing departments, for families, so they'll learn more about their houses, learn about maintaining their houses, um, and that funding piece, getting houses, getting more houses, and getting houses which are culturally appropriate. And uh, I think one of the most interesting studies which I've seen was done by a um, cultural housing architect, where he looked at how houses are utilized. And if I go home to my house, um, my, my wife will be in her room uh, doing her emails. My kids will each be in their bedroom, hopefully doing, doing their homework, but probably watching YouTube videos. Um, but everyone's in a different house. And what he found is in most indigenous housing, everybody hangs out in the living room. The kids do, the adults do. And so you've got all these bedrooms off on the side that aren't used very much. 
and coming up with houses that reflect the way people in these communities use their houses, perhaps more of a circular design so the things can congregate better and you also get more even heating, uh, would make a lot of sense. Uh, so once again, that funding piece is important. And we certainly do need more research. We need to, uh, to come up with better ways of measuring mold. Um, we spent hours talking about how to measure mold and there's still no perfect way of doing this and I wish there was. Um, and we need ways of coming up with more effective HRVs and, and more effective ways of transferring heat and ventilation around in a house that doesn't have duct work. So with that, I'd like to, I've got lots and lots to be able to acknowledge. So I'll start off with uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada with uh, Health Canada, uh, the First Nations and Inuit branch in Health Canada, or now ISC, sorry, uh, NAN, of course, uh, SLIFNA, um, the Children's Hospital, Carleton University, the Northern School of Medicine, uh, and by far and away the most important, uh, Chief and Council and the communities uh, and the study families in, in, in Slack Sewell and Casabonica in uh, Kitchenamakas of Anunawag and in um, uh, Sandy Lake First Nation uh, who have been incredibly supportive in getting this research done. So uh, miigwech. Thank you. And let me open this up to questions. I find it very interesting that um, we all know why a lot of HRVs don't work or the problems with them from the original design, the install correct installation, maintenance, and then people just not understanding them. So the whole education aspect. One of the things that really bothers me is though, I look at the cost of a medevac. Uh, it's probably what, close to $10,000 per medevac? Would that be about right? Uh, probably about 15 around here. Oh, okay. That's a lot of money that could have been saved by changing how we deal with uh, HRVs. I know one of the big issues for the federal government when you talk about HRVs is the efficiency of them. You know, they're talking about, the, oh, they like to see 75, 85% efficiency on an HRV to help heat that indoor air coming in when it's working, uh, when it isn't iced up or unplugged. Um, I can't help but think at the same time, maybe we really need to look at how HRVs work and stop worrying about the efficiency of the heat exchange and start adding heaters onto the HRV, including and not charging for the power for those HRVs to do that. You know, if the government would start looking at paying the cost of improving the indoor air quality through the mechanical device like an HRV to keep the occupants healthy, I think they're gonna recoup it on all their health medevacs and uh, hospital child care, everything down, down the road. And from my end, I work for Natural Resources Canada and I'm very well aware of the ventilation issues. Uh, that's something that I'm gonna st strongly start espousing that uh, we look at this from more than just a uh, myopic single point of view on efficiency. And I think, because we all know that when you ventilate, it costs the house. It's, even though you have an energy efficient house, ventilation is a penalty. And uh, I think we have to start reversing that and thinking about it from a health aspect. Thanks. Absolutely, thank you for your comments. I, I can tell that in Nunavut, uh, the single biggest expense for their health, uh, their, uh, health department is aviation fuel for, for the medevacs. Yeah, please. Sorry, I just wanted to add something to that. Um, your point about uh, medevacs um, a few years ago when we before we even started this this study uh, it was uh, work uh, uh, I, was, I used to work alongside uh, Saul Mamakwa he was our health advisor at NAN at the time and he'd done a lot of work with the Shibugama communities and uh, Dr. Tom uh, sorry Dr. Uh, Mike uh, Michael Kurlu and um, we talked about how and this uh, one of Kurlu's Dr. Kurlu's, Kurlu's stories was you know um, children he would see would be medevaced from the community. And um, so he would address the illness, you know. Then they would go back to the home that was making them sick, right? And so uh, you're exactly right. It's about, you know, about 15000 per medevac. And can that, can that cost be used, uh, utilized somewhere else? You know, I think 
Uh, I forget the exact number, but uh, a few years ago, I think it was about 2,800 medevacs in the Nan territory, right? And so I, I don't know the math on that, but it's a, I know it's a large uh, it's a large cost there. And the other final piece is medevacs have more to it than just the money. Uh, you're taking a sick child, you're taking a mom out of her community to to um, to a totally strange environment. There, there's emotional, there's psychological costs, which are also really important to these things. Yes, good morning. My name is uh, Paul Jonab. I'm a land counselor for uh, North Caribou. And I remember when Mike was a student in Windigo. He was just a young boy now. <laughs> Anyways, I uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, inform the people here that uh, one of our elders passed away last night, 926 in Sulca, because of respiratory problems. And uh, he was one of our, also one of our housing foreman back in the day and uh, I live in a home where the house was built in the 70s it was from rough lumber and no crawl space and uh, it hasn't moved at that time there's uh, the carpenters at that time that the uh, they were really, even though they didn't go to school, they were really skilled in what they did. But with the new housing now, you know, I, I've been uh, in the leadership for about 20 years now, and uh, part of it has been a uh, housing portfolio. And I also, uh, I'm also an electrician. But, uh, <clears throat> The most common thing that I, I see and I hear is that uh, there needs to be education and awareness to the homeowners. A lot of times I hear about HRV. The usual comment I hear is it, it's making too much noise, so they turn it off and they, and they cover the, the air vents. And soon you'll find that uh, there's a uh, mold growing in the crawl space. So I think one of the really important things is to, uh, to educate and made aware of the, these things with, to the old owners. And also our people need to uh, take ownership of the homes. And that's another thing that I see is that, you know, if there's a leak in the washroom or something, they won't, they won't uh, fix it. They'll just let it be. Soon, soon the, the, the floor is rotting out because a lot of times they don't have money to pay for it. Eh? They don't have money to pay for the plumber to come or the electrician. So. Those things that we, we face that in. Eh? Sometimes we have a home, new house, within five years that, you know, it's rotted out. So I think we need, that's another, what I'm saying that we need to educate our people, aware of people too. And I think we need more funding for our housing so we can, uh, so we can uh, pay for these electricians and, uh, Plumbers, we have limited, limited funding. We get from government, eh? and that's all we get. So, I would like to uh, uh, say thank you very much. And this, this is my first time attending this housing conference, even though I've been in council for twenty years. <laughs> so, I'm very glad that I come here. Thank you, Rich. Rich. So thank you so much for your comments. And, and you know, we were, as we were talking last night, maybe going to, to, to your communities and having a town hall meeting, uh, bring an HRV and just stick it in the middle of the floor, let people see it, uh, let people try changing the filters. 
Um, and again, so, you know, the, so they get that education, they take ownership, they realize what it's there for, why they have it. Um, I, I think will help. Hi, my name is Becky Bikinu. Um, I come from Southern Ontario, but I'm an advocate for what's called natural building. Um, I've had a straw bell home for 20 years and it never grew mold. Um, but I'm interested in the last study you referenced when you were talking about cultural appropriate homes and you didn't mention the name of the study or the author. Thank you too for your good talk. Thank you. Um, when I heard when I heard this this gentleman talking, it was at a conference, and I've been kicking myself ever since. I for, I forgot to write down his name, so um, I wish I could answer your question, but I can't. I will look. Yes. Oh, there's one on the Hello, hello. I, I guess uh, good presentation, a lot of good information. Um, before I joined DEFNA, the KI and uh, Lac Sul are two of our communities. I would have been like to have been involved a lot more, but uh, you know, some of the good points that you talk about is uh, that it just needs to be uh, better planning. Uh, it all starts from when you first want to build homes, is that you involve your technical department, you involve the community, and you discuss what type of house you want to build. You discuss the floor plan. Uh, when you talk about wanting to have the HRV not in the crawl space, you have to do that pre-planning so that you have room for it in your mechanical space or your utility room. Because HRVs are an afterthought. And uh, even if you want to have the ducting on the main floor, then you got to talk about having nine foot walls, 10 foot walls, because it does cost additional money. If you want to put ductwork on the main floor, you have to build bulkheads. So th there's different ways to achieve a better mechanical system. And I know last year I went to Enercan also, they are working on a, a dual core system. Uh, I haven't heard from them yet. I told them to give me a call when they have that system more finalized to come and present here. So maybe next year here at the housing conference, we're gonna see that new HRV where they have a dual uh, co core from Enercan. So th there's lots of good points that the doctor made and a lot of it can be addressed with proper planning. And uh, too bad there's another session right now, Clarence and uh, Charles Patagos, they're talking about pre-planning. And those are the steps that you guys have to do um, you got, as uh, leadership, chief and council, you know, it's important to build houses, but also you need to involve your tech people from the start. When you make those trips to the supplier and you get those, uh, you know, no offense to anyone here, but those piss poor plans that uh, the lumber yards give you, you know, you don't know what you're getting. You know, you're investing sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 just to buy the material, then you got to transport it up north you want to make sure that you're getting the right right material and the right system that will meet your needs. Because uh, normally we get called in us tech people, we get called in after the fact when there's problems. So that's on you. If you want better homes, all of you have a tech person, all of you have housing people in your community, you have elders in your community, you got to involve them. Housing needs to be taken more seriously Housing does fail in 15 to 20 years. That's just because of poor planning. Yes, we do have issues of overcrowding, but you can over-design ventilation systems. If you have 17 people in your home, buy a bigger HRV, increase your ductwork. There's many ways to do it, and I think you just didn't have to be, reach out to your tech people. Take that time to include them. Don't feel rushed, right? We should be talking about housing now for next year. But no, we wait until after Christmas and we say, all right, Winter Road is going to be built soon. Let's go pick up some house plans. No, you need to start planning now. And then once you find standards that fit, keep using those standards and keep building on them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 